can see your beard, Kobus. Oh, I don't know if that's good or bad. There we go. <laughs> Light is on. It is on. And also, hello, I need to. Hello, hello. I need to sit like this today to hide the mess that's behind me. Uh, I'm busy. Uh, we can't see the mess so far. Uh, <laughs> I'm busy sorting all of my tools and computer parts and all of those things bit by bit. I it's very a, messy. I have a box of computer parts next to me. Uh, I've got over the <clears throat> over the last week, and um, I'm still trying to uh, figure out what I'm gonna do with it. So, uh, oh yeah. <clears throat> But yes, 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 yes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of uh, Dev Beard Ops uh, with not Kobus and not Darko. You get to guess which one is which. Uh, <clears throat> this is a weekly show we do on, on, on Twitch here at AWS and our own respective Twitch slash YouTube channels um, where we talk about technology, the cloud, AWS, baldness, and yeah. It's called Dev Beard Ops because... Well, I, I guess you can see, but the board, important thing is, it's the beard on the inside that counts. So if mm. you cannot grow a beard on the outside, I'm sure you can grow a beard on the inside. So <clears throat> today is well. First of all, how are you doing, Kobus? Are you good? Me, I'm all good. I'm doing well. Uh, I'm actually very uh, energized today, as they say, because we've got our first um, like rainstorm for the year. Like we've had a bit of rain, obviously this year so far, but it's some of the side in Cape Town. Um, and we've got a first like storm storm where it's like yeah. storm warnings and wind and flooding warnings and all that. So it's been raining since last night, and I love the rain. So it's like this is quite nice sitting inside, listening to the rain. Well, slowly it's coming to winter now, or or, or actually fall in, in in South Africa, right? So, um, no, you're not doing it right, Darko. It's coming to winter. A winter, okay. Winter yes. in South Africa. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, the winter is slowly ending in Germany here, so it's it has been minus six last night in Berlin, but um, um it's better now. So it's <laughs> mm. we have sunshine. It's you know we started to get flowers outside, so hopefully sometimes mm. it's gonna be better. Um, cool, cool. Well, happy to yeah. hear that you're energized. I also feel the same thing about rain. I love the rain, and it's, um, mm. it's it makes a day better. I know. Hate me. Okay. And also, uh, just my weekly disclaimer, this isn't Guinness. This is just caffeine and sugar-free tab. I wish it was Guinness, but it's a little bit early for that, given that it's a work day. Sugar-free tab is a drink they have in South Africa. Just an FYI. Yes. It's, it's a cola right drink. Uh, uh, because yeah, it's it used to be American, I believe. Tap Cola was like an American thing. Mm. It doesn't. It's not sold in, in the U.S. anymore, I believe. So it's only. Well, it's not going to be sold yet either soon. Um, Coca Cola actually announced like scrapping, I think, half of the brands that are not that popular, and Tap wow. is one of them, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, there you go. First mm. question to the audience, everybody out there: uh, Is the are the audio levels between us? Can good? you hear us? Can you hear us? I'm sure you can, but. Uh, are they just level? Mm. Because I can see, I can hear Kobus yeah. fine, although he does sound a bit quiet to me. I uh, just want to make sure oh. that we are equally equally loud. Uh, but that just me, might be me, Kobus. So it's it's really not um, not not. I just need to not indicative. No, I just need to check because I did have my three old doing things on my desk. So okay. if there's a knob, she tends to turn turn things and <laughs> press buttons, and yeah, that's why okay. I no longer have that live tweet button. Ah, the live tweet button. Okay. <laughs> yeah, be careful about those and, and little kids. Oh, yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay. So, so, Darko, what ahead. are we talking about? What are we talking about? Um, hmm. Well, actually, last time, where last we left off um, was at um, Cliffhanger, where we talked about dun, dun, dun. software testing. We, we spent the last week's stream about discussing on how do you... Uh, do software testing. I'm lower. Okay, give me a second, uh, Mr. M. D. Lawrence. I want to make sure we're we're all all equally as loud. Um, <coughs> but um, this, oh, wait, 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 no, no, no. It's the Streamyard thing. Um, audio mic vol mic volume. I think, I think is is this better now? Um, Darko is soft. Yes, I I get told that. A he lot. is a softy. Oh. He gives great hugs. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, I will, I will try to increase my audio level because, uh, <clears throat> what is it? This, this, uh, tool we're using StreamYard is, a mm. has its own audio uh, management. So, um, mm. also I can go here and my volume mixer, oh, windows, where art thou? Uh, open sound settings, sounds, so many buttons, input, hmm. no, not that. 
Input. Input. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. So good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Awesome. So last we left off, we talked about software testing. We talked about yes. Where do you catch errors when you deploy code? Hmm. Where is it the cheapest to catch errors inside of your lovely text editor or your IDE? Hmm. Up to well, your unit testing. I would think the last thing hmm. we talked about was unit testing, and before that, we talked about your your code reviews. Yeah. So um, yeah, today we're going to be taking a step further. We're going to talk about something called integration testing and some end-to-end -end testing, and finally, mm. testing in production. So that's kind of the topic of today. And um, I'll, everybody on stream, feel free to chip in, feel free to add your comments, mm. add your ideas. Um, this is not a one-way discussion. Uh, we like to discuss this with you. So if you have questions regarding this, if you have your comments, and we had a lot of great people pitch in last time. Um, mm. So um, thank you very much, <clears throat> and, and please continue to do so. So Kobus, um integration testing. What is it when I tell you well, actually no let's let's step back. Unit testing. What do you how do you see unit testing? Explain to me unit testing. Okay. So you are testing a unit of code or functionality inside your application. So let's say um take that example of what I've been working on is a thing that processes data from sources and then um stores it. So one of the sources in my case is YouTube data. So okay. what I've got tests for is that given this following input. So the way I structure my code is that there's something that reads a file or calls an API to get the data okay. or calls a database. And then once it's got the data, it sends the data into a function or method. And then that method takes the information and does something for it and turns it into a list of other objects or Correct. aggregates the data or something and then spits it back out. Now, what a unit test will be is that I write a piece of code that says, here's the input and this is the expected output. So if I give you a list of three YouTube videos each with 10 views and 10 minutes watched. If this function aggregates, I expect the output to say three videos in total 30 minutes, if that's what the function does. Yeah. So what you do is you write that little test, then you create, go create the method, you figure out the logic, you write it, and then you run this unit test against that method. And then what it does is it actually obviously validates, does that piece of code that you just wrote do what it's supposed to be doing based on the input and output that you control inside your unit test? Um, and then it becomes a little bit more fun as well is that you also in your unit test want to test for things that scenarios that uh, you may encounter in the future. For example, what happens if I send in an empty list or what happens yeah. if I send in a list where some of the fields are missing to make sure that the app actually can handle those based on the, on the different scenarios that you're dealing with. So just test a small unit of code inside your bigger application. I think that's the big thing. Um, you know, when I first uh, met a unit test, for me, what a unit test is like, <coughs> oh, it's just going to do it all. It, I, I just give it my code and it does something. Uh, hmm. I want to make sure that my code works and my unit test will check if my code works. That's not the thing. Unit test check specific things, as Copa says. So a specific unit of code, of work, it only tests that. Uh, however, uh, there's also a couple of more rules when it comes to unit testing um, that I've, I've read upon is what Ooh. makes a unit test a unit test uh, compared to something else. So what I read, and you can argue with this with me on this one, is a unit test should never touch a database. A unit no. test should never reach out to the internet. Unit tests should not even write to a file system. Mm -mm. So unit test just does a specific small thing. So if you have a unit test that <coughs> needs, if you have a test that needs to pull something from an external API, mock it, create yeah. a, a JSON object locally that's going to read from it and just act like, oh, this is the data I received. Let me see if I'm doing something. That is very important. Because mm. if you start introducing dependencies into unit tests, gee golly, yep. that's going to take a you... lot of time. <laughs> well, not only does it take a lot of time, it also causes problems for you because mm -hmm. what happens when the API that you're calling is down right. or the data yeah. in the database isn't the same data or the text file is missing. And then even fun over time is you start hitting like API limits if you've yeah. got lots of tests yeah. running the whole time. Uh, the API might uh, change and then all of a sudden you cannot validate that your code does what it's supposed to instead of just validating that small yeah. get the data from the API section. So no, no, those are very, very valid points. Yeah, so because um, you want to make sure that your code is working, not everything else. Mm. Um, 
you get to that everything else part later down in the line because you know if your function if you have a little method in your in your object that does something and you want to test if that is working then you just test that not, not mm. everything else around it you will give it mock data you will give it something that's gonna emulate an actual thing happening and it's gonna mm -hmm. output is it true or not so and, yeah. and this is a great example with, with your thing so cobus's application processes some data from youtube instead of cobus's unit test going out to youtube and getting that data cobus just has a json file locally mm. or csv file with information with mock information <clears throat> that tests against that so mm. Yeah, I mean, even like an example here is that um, I've got a, a YAML config file for the actual application that I'm going to be, obviously, I want to test all the different configuration scenarios. I don't have 50 config files. I've got strings inside my unit test saying, here is the entire YAML blob mm -hmm. for these tests and then change them as I need to. Exactly, exactly. So, so mm -hmm. those are unit tests, right? And, and discussions between, okay, so what is a unit test and what is an integration test? they can look very similar so mm. when it comes to the actual code behind it and if for example if you're using python your python pi test can do both unit tests and integration tests doesn't matter it's just the mm. way you test things that are different when you do integration testing and the name integration there has a reason because you're integrating all of your different units to perform a piece of work or to perform a mm. thing and you're testing that. Now, this is where actually, yeah. um, and again, according to my reading, uh, you are not, it's not the developer who runs the unit tests. It's the testing team that runs the unit tests. Uh, the no, tests, no, 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 Docker, this isn't the 90s, slow down. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, so if you, uh, I'd be scared if you tell me there's a developer that has access to tests that is not running them. Um, because Good. that it means that the developer is not building tests to make sure that it goes working. Um, just quickly for those um, in the chat, can those those of you that are doing active development at the moment or involved with software development, tell us how many of you actually play with the tests, run the tests, uh, add to the tests, or modify them. We want to get a sense of like who else is involved in it. Because, um, like I said, if you're writing code, you need to write tests to make sure that your code is actually working the way you're supposed to. Otherwise, it's just like, you know, hope to have been development where, you know, I hope this works. I hope this doesn't break. And if you want to be really uncomfortable, go to the owner of the company and say, listen, we're going to be releasing code this Friday um, and we hope it works. We yeah. haven't tested it. We just hope it works and, you, and see the reaction and then use that as a barometer to figure out, are you doing the right thing or not? Um, let me know how it goes. Um, I'd love yeah. to hear. Yeah, because like, you should be doing the writing, test writing. There is a mm. testing team, of course, but that's something else that is somewhere beyond. Mm. But you should be the one as a developer who writes those tests, if you are a developer, right? Mm. Uh, 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 so Learning T says, I do it as a part of deployment jobs. Uh, it tests all unit test cases. Okay, absolutely. Mm. So your pipelines, your deployment jobs should run your tests. Now, the difference here is, what are you testing in which phase? Yeah. Um, if you if you look at the 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 the, the standard CI CD pipeline, you have your your source phase, your build phase, your test phase, and your deploy phase. Um, usually, the unit tests are part of the, the 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 build phase when your code is being built. This is where you run your unit test just to make sure that each of those units is doing what it should be once it has been built or if there is a build at all. So. Hmm. Um, but then the 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 actual integration test the thing we're mm. kind of trying to slowly uh, ink to comes at the at the second phase the test phase mm. this is where um an automated solution now there's a lot of them i, I mean i i have not had a lot of experience with like with the big ones like selenium and and whatnot but but this is where a solution actually runs those integration tests. Mm. So, Cobus, what are yes. integration tests? So, integration tests to me are where you actually test are all of the components of your systems working together to solve a specific thing. So, for example, you would spin up a, let's say you're doing microservice architecture. You've got five different services that are running and when you, for example, create a user or update a piece of data, it goes through more than one of these systems. So what integration testing would be is to have a framework that can spin up the system 
and actually then run a test saying, listen, when I invoke the create user, if it's an API call or however you do it, does it pass through the different systems and then check that A, it creates the user in the end, so have some kind of database or mocked out database, there are ways to mock that out in memory as well. Um, and does it create end up creating that user and did all of the code parts execute and do what they were supposed to be doing? So you're more like, it's more like almost block, black box testing where there's this box, you don't necessarily care what's going on in the middle, but you know, when I feed it this, it needs to output that. Yeah. So you've got that, this, that some type scenarios. We make sure that, you know, everything is working in correctly. And also where this becomes important is like with systems, for example, um, that you do uh, inversion of code. What's it? Uh, IOC. Um, inversion of code. Inversion of concerns. Where okay. you do, for example, if you use like uh, uh, injecting different classes and wiring them up at runtime, not at necessarily development time. So you've got interfaces in different, like um, versions of the code, well, not versions of the code, different implementations of the code, depending yeah. on the scenario. You can start testing those kind of things, which are only doable at runtime. Because in a unit test, you can say, well, I'm using testing this specific class, but I've got two or three different ones, depending on what we're doing. So that's where the integration tests become important. Yeah. yeah. And, and to that example, like when you create a <coughs> user, usually it's not a single action, you know? Mm. Usually it's not, it's not a single function or it shouldn't be a single function. It shouldn't even be a single API call. You might have an API yeah. call that says, create me this user, but that API call is going to invoke a whole bunch of other things to do that. And an integration test is actually running those things, integrated sets of different units that achieve a certain outcome. And this is where your unit tests go ahead and reach out to external things. They can, they can also have mocked, mocked up things. You can have mockups just... You know, people place mockups uh, actually in integration tests because if an external dependency fails, they want to be able to test it even then. But you have to be careful if an external dependency fails, your test doesn't catch that or <laughs> mm. you should be able to catch that an external dependency has failed uh, before. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and I think integrations are, integration tests are, are, are very critical because they literally mm. tell you, will this work? And... They are the thing. Uh, that, okay. They tell so, you will it work to a certain point yes, once yes. in because remember there's only one production. Exactly. There's they will tell you it, <laughs> if, it will, if it will work. Almost. There is yes. and oh that's a very good quote. There is only one production. Yes. Um, <laughs> I need to print that out. There is only one production. Um, yes. Because your biggest test is in production. <laughs> you know, believe it or not, that well, is the test. Uh, the, the, the best quote I ever heard was something along the lines of every single company out there has got testers to test their product. Some companies are just fortunate that it isn't their users. Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the worst way you can test something is, well, actually confirm if something is <clears throat> working is by getting a customer ticket. So uh, if you... If oh, no, you no, 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 no. Twi twi Twitter. 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 Storm. Twitter. Well, okay. Yeah. Let's, let, let, yeah, let's move to Twitter. Uh, so if Twitter is your um, integration test, um, <laughs> that that may be a problem, and, and and don't get me wrong, your code is gonna fail in production. Be sure of it. Mm. Like, yeah, bigger companies have code problems in 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 production, and that will just always happen, no matter how good you build your unit test. Mm. And and Amazon actually, uh, let me find this article. Uh, it's on the builders to a uh, builders library. Is um, there's a good oh, yeah. article by Claire on how our pipelines work, how mm. AWS's pipelines work. It's just amazing. We have this big old set of 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 of, um, of integration tests. So um, let me actually just uh, give me a second while I while I search for that. It's a, it's a, it's a great point because what that article um, I believe digs into. I've, I've read a bit of it. I haven't had time to read fully in one sitting. Um, is deployment is interesting because usually when we think about deployments, it's a let's kick off a single deployment. It runs the completion, and then we're done, and we can now deploy the next one and it runs the completion and it's done. But when you, um, um, <laughs> sorry, this is quite fun. There's a comment here about Protoduff that says, I think I'm drunk, I'm seeing double. Uh, yes. Um, but when you start doing large scale systems, especially where you've got multiple different teams working on the code base, deployments can start being triggered very close together. And then things become super interesting because what happens is that two deployments are now queued. Do you deploy the first one to completion 
and then only deploy the second one? Or do you say, let's roll up to the second one. We know that we've got these two units. And then when something goes wrong, well, how do we figure out which one was the, um, the, the, the one that introduced the change? And then if we need to roll back, can we roll back? How do we roll back? All of those things. Yep. Yeah. Rollback strategies are, I think, a completely different topic. Rollback oh, strategies yeah, yeah. are just, um, you know, there, there's different ways to do that. <clears throat> we'll mention some of them when it comes to, like, you know, the testing and production. But um, this document, um, actually, let me paste the link in the in the chats here just mm. so you can have a look. By the way, the Amazon Builders Library is just excellent. Yes. Oh, Very technical yes. Do- library of documents on how Amazon does things. Great. So this document has, has been written by Claire. Uh, and it's about how we do CI, CD um, for, at Amazon now. So it, it mm. describes all the different phases. And by the way, these links will be available later on in the description uh, if you missed on, out on them. But um, basically, they explain how do we work with source and build. This is where our, our unit tests are, are, are living, for example. In the build phase, this is where the unit tests are. This yeah. is where your static analysis, your coverage checks, all of your things that are part of that are. Mm. But then once you move to this integration part, the, the, the test part, this is where a lot of different things happen. This is where yeah. your, uh, you know, your, um, your actual integration test is. But this is also where the load tests exist. And, 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 and metrics monitoring, that's a, that's a very interesting point. Um, metrics are are not your te- standard test per se it's not like oh well um you know um does my code work or not your code may work mm. but what if all of a sudden your code impacts m- your metrics by a lot make things slower yeah it increases the so let's say you have a uh, let's go back to that user api thing um you have an api that creates a user and you make changes to it unit tests go fine it does what it should you go to integration tests it does it fine perfect it creates users it's all great mm. but it takes three times as long because now yep. you made a change so metrics in this case metric monitoring is very important so you will see this outline is like okay um why does my user creation take seven minutes now instead of <laughs> you know five seconds mm-hmm. um that's also very important yeah, and also the thing here to understand is that remember software is complex systems dealing with different components. So let's say the database is a classic example where you have unintended side effects. So just by changing the wave, let's say I'm creating user and I'm inserting them into a okay. table, but I introduce some new logic where I could do an interesting heavy query on multiple other tables, including the transaction table, um, to check have we seen a user with similar names just before now as a random example. Yeah. That causes load on that table. And depending on how you structure your query, you can potentially create locks on the table affecting other systems, even though your piece of code doesn't touch that other area of code. And that'll only be picked up in this area because now what happens is all of a sudden you're now running your new code against along with all the other code that keeps hitting the database as well. And now we start seeing, well, you introduced new user logic, yeah. but all transactions are slow. So this is where it becomes important. Yeah. And 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 in our example, so um, in our testing phase, we have different stages of that testing. We have alpha, mm-hmm. beta, and gamma, and also gamma one box. But they're <clears throat> all different likenesses of production. So alpha is the least like production. Beta is a bit more. Gamma is as mo- as product as most production can be. But also, there's a different gamma version, the one box version, where it's where it's running on a single thing instead of a multiple uh, cluster of servers. So this is where you actually get to test your load, as Koba said, right? Just to make sure that mm. this thing doesn't break anything else. Um, because, you know, if code, code can work without, you know, you noticing that it will break things along the line. So. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, a no, lot no, of things. Um, <clears throat> um, so yeah, uh, there's a bunch of things like backward compa- backwards compatibility testing also, because you want to make sure that um, your your code that you deploy does not break the compatibility of other things because yes. um, one of the, one of the things that it's not just like oh it will break my other elements Be, no because your some systems might still want to talk to the old version of the API for a while until this one is done unless 
you know you will not want to break break an api or a, or a, or a service or something that can no longer talk to some other older ones so mm. that is that is pretty important to do those things as well but it's um, but it's also like if you scroll a little bit down to show that uh, diagram over there is that um the the way you should be rolling out your service is not to say here's version 2 everything yeah. version down down version 2 comes up because a that is a service interruption because all of a sudden while version two is coming up or if you've got version two already up and you just yeah. shift traffic across if something does go wrong it goes wrong for 100 percent of your users correct um and that's a problem which means yeah. that what you want to do is you want to gradually and this is where the term canaries um you might have heard like canary testing or canary release comes in and it's from the canaries they used to use in the coal mines which would warn people if there was a gas leak because the canary would um uh, pass out first and you'd immediately see well the canary's yeah. passing out we're going to be passing out soon next let's you know get out of here um so what you do is you release the new version and you send a small portion of the traffic to it and there are various strategies around how do i decide who are the people that are going to be testing this goes but then and then you start looking at the metrics and everything for that second version as well. Look at error rates, response times, even anything that makes sense to yep. you. And then you gradually increase the number of people that use that over time until you reach 100%. And then you still wait a little bit just to make sure that this is actually working before you then deprecate um, the version one deployments. Yeah, and as you can, as you can see here, in in our gamma box, gamma gamma one box, and the gamma uh, gamma stages, this is where we run our canary test constantly. Um, this is where it's kind of even on the test environment, you're, you're running canary tests because um, you want to be able to notice the things. And canary tests are just a, a just a test that keeps on increasing the amount of being deployed while it is listening for mistakes. You have a bunch of alarms, bunch of metrics trying to monitor, mm. just seeing if something happens. The same thing like you look for your canary so it's still alive in, in, in its cage. So yeah, mm. um, pretty important. Um, so I, I would say that the, the, the testing phase or the unit or the integration testing phase as, you, as, 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 as seen here is the most complex one. This is where, mm. this is yeah. where you have dedicated testing theme, teams for this. Once again, potentially, depending potentially. on the size of the company, depending on how you're doing it, um, what you don't want is, um, I mean, I can tell you a very fun place I worked at, I won't obviously mention the place, but okay. basically we had development teams, we had testing teams, and we had uh, ops teams. Okay. And then also the PM, the product management teams, and each had different incentives. Project management was scored on how many features and were the features delivered on time, Okay. not whether the features were working or not. Okay. Um, <laughs> first, off. yeah, yeah, this, it, it gets better. You're going to enjoy this one. Then we had the testing team. The testing team was incentivized by the number of bugs that they logged, which just as a quick side note, I was working on reporting at the time and I was a little bit inconsistent with the title of the reports. Um, so I had 50 individual tickets logged with full stop missing at end of report title, because guess what? That was 50 tickets for them. Instead of having one bug ticket saying, listen, here's a list of reports. The title doesn't have the full stop in or it needs or whatever. Go fix all of these 50. And then once we're done, we continue with it. Um, and then you had the ops team, which was measured on uptime and number of errors in production. And now you can see this, this whole recipe for disaster because the PMs push to get things out regardless of whether they're working or not. The QA team is being fanatical about any small thing that they can nail you on um, trying to get it there. They didn't have a penalty for production breaking, which is interesting. They only had were incentivized for a number of bugs. Um, and then ultimately the poor ops team were like, always like, we don't want to release anything because it's going to break the whole time. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's, I think you're so, on mute, so, yeah. so that's the, yeah, I'm on mute. So that's, that's also a thing when it comes to like, you know, different types of metrics for your teams and you have to be careful with that mm -hmm. as well. So, um, I'm just trying to put up something on here on screen so people who join the stream know. <coughs> Give me a second. Um, entertain the folks while I try type out something here on, 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 on StreamYard. By the way, to answer the question from somebody later on, um, <laughs> yes, we're using StreamYard. It's a, it's a wonderful yes. tool. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what else have I seen that has, um, uh, where it has actually worked is like when you get the more modern way of building software with the, the dev team, the testing team, and let's say you've still got a separate ops team, they actually sit together and work and start planning out how features get rolled out, where the checks need to be, how to uh, make sure that the code is working, where everybody works together and everybody's aligned both on what they want to do and also how things are being measured. Yeah. Because if you say testing, developers, product managers, and all of that, here is your set of criteria that defines success releasing X number of features, 
that are working yeah. without yeah. with this number of bugs in production only then all of a sudden and oh and uptime the developers concerned about uptime the developers concerned about bug count qa is concerned about uptime and all of that so that means that everybody actually works together so think about that in terms of when you start talking about this yeah 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 exactly exactly so you know um if 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 you're in management or if you're managing developers give them incentives to write good code um you know don't just have hey you can have a developer just bash out wrong code and it will be caught somewhere down the line but that's not the goal <laughs> you know if we have if even if you have proper testing strategies make sure that hey, they're incentivized by um mm -hmm. by doing good code because I, I mentioned this last time but it's not the same cost of a test in different stages if we go back to that pipeline your source phase your text editor your git repo is the cheapest place to fail because you mm -hmm. don't you will not inconvenience anybody besides your t text editor or maybe somebody looking at your code when you move mm -hmm. to unit tests, this is where you actually engage a system to do things you spend cpu cycles it costs a bunch but if your test fails on integration this is where you actually deploy that code and started interacting with different services you can put a, a significant money value on that and of course <laughs> the worst mm. test to fail is in production and well you don't want to hear your twitter knocking on your door and saying hey darko your software sucks um so yeah it, 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 it is pretty important to 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 kind of mm. try to try to get the things correct in the correct places <laughs> but I mean, the, the this feedback loop is interesting. There's another f aspect to this, which is not just the time in terms of it takes to actually get um, okay. the code or to pick up the bug. It's also to yeah. fix the bug because Absolutely. here's the thing with software developers. We finish the code and then we move on to the next task. Yep. If you bring me a bug back five seconds after I wrote the code, it's all going to be still in brain. It's literally yep. like, a, uh, like a computer where it's in, in memory and I know I've got yep. the context and I have to fix this. If you bring me this bug three weeks later, after I've done five other things, I'm going to have to go like, um, let me go look at the code again. Let me see if I can figure it out. What was I thinking about yeah. this? I didn't document it properly. Uh, it'll take you longer to fix as well. Um, and the, the worst part then is that that's a bad cycle because now all of a sudden, whatever you were working on is interrupted. You're switching context to fix that old bug. Then you come back to this, um, what you were working on, switch back context, it slows down this talk and you get into this whole cycle of constant interruptions um, and uh, you go into firefighting mode where it's like the code quality just decreases. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So so I, that, that's a very excellent point. The faster you get the problem noticed, <clears throat> the faster mm. it will take the developer to fix it. Not just, you know, comp not the mean time to resolve, but literally how much time will it take the developer to figure out, oh, that's an error in my code. Because... If you tell them, hey, this doesn't do it correctly, the developer may immediately, oh yeah, it's on line 45. I remember it. Let me do that. So it yep. is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is a really good point on that. So good catch. Oh yeah, yeah, no. And uh the the comment down here from Canada, which is, or oh, you forget entirely and ask who wrote this stuff. Wrote this um stuff? <laughs> I have done this so many times where I went into the code base and I got upset, like, who the hell wrote this crap code? And then I look <laughs> and I'm like, uh, this guy <laughs> get logged yeah <laughs> is, it, is it called good blame uh it, yeah you can use good blame yeah. to actually get yeah, to flag things it's yeah it's <laughs> i've it's, been yeah, there it, many times yeah but um it, it, it's important in that sense so you find those things out so integration tests are important mm. um, integration tests your metric monitoring and all those things are important to to have them in the right stage of your development cycle mm. so you may catch those errors those problems at the correct thing because unit tests and integration are definitely not the same thing they may mm -hmm. look on the outset as the same thing but as Robert said an integration test is a black box test it's a it's a little thing that you don't see inside you just give it something and you expect something back while integration yeah. tests you actually test those things inside that's the the, the transparent box or however you would like to call uh, it. Oh, no, 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 no. You're confusing the two now because the integration tests are the black box where you just oh, put something in and you expect something out. Yeah, just yeah. to clarify, yeah. Okay, yeah. Right yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. But now, um, talking about uh, the the uh, the other types of testing, so something that goes after you 
you finish your integration tests after you finish your mm. testing. Um, there's something called an end-to-end -end test. Um, yes. And I've, I've heard this term a lot, right? Oh, we do end-to-end -end testing. Um, how would you define end-to-end -end testing, Kobus? Um, I will get to that. But before that, we just quickly have to thank our sponsors. Sorry, I just realized we're in the middle of the thing. I'm just kidding. We don't have sponsors. Um, <laughs> I just want to... <laughs> Sorry, in case you're wondering, I like putting pranks on Darko as well. I, I, I love humor and I love making people uncomfortable. And if you rewind this or watch this again later, you will see how quickly you went like, oh, no. is it, I, I, this is not a paid show. No, I just want to quickly, because I saw now we've had a couple of people join, just quickly re um, reiterate what we're doing. Is, uh, this is the second session that we've been talking about how to test software, where we test software, how to test software and all of that. And also just quickly, um, you will see the links to the YouTube channels down below where the video will be posted. This one will go on the Not Quibbers, Not Darko channel. Um, and... Um, Suggest if you want to see when they come out, go subscribe there. Cool. Now that we've uh, lost a lot of people because I was joking about sponsors. Um, <laughs> you got me like, and I was in, in a moment like, who is our, what? <laughs> okay. So Yes, yeah, sorry. I couldn't resist doing that. Cool. Um, back to end-to-end -end testing. So how end-to-end -end testing would differ in terms of how I view them in to integration testing is integration testing is you are trying to test the, the system as in does all the different components work well together. End-to-end yep. -to -end testing is literally like when I make the API call, I go and look at what happens in, let's say, for example, the database or uh, where it goes on the other side, like let you go to, to test the full end-to-end -end run of calls through the system and also make sure that it hits persistence and uh, external API calls and all of that and actually uh, yep. does that. Um, I'm actually now quite upset because I see we had about nine people drop off the stream now with my joke about the sponsor. So apologies for that if you are watching this later. <laughs> Do you have problems with VPN? Um... <laughs> no, we're not going to go there. We're but yeah, there. Um, and <clears throat> interesting does become a little bit more difficult because um, uh, knowing what to expect in the database is the statement is simple. I want to make sure that the data is there based on what I did. But it does assume you know what the current state of the database is before doing that test and then also what the expected state after the test is. And with databases, that's something that's difficult because especially if you're doing these end-to-end -end tests on, let's say, a live system, things are flowing past. You can't just say, um, I expect, I'm creating a call to say create a new user and therefore I'm expecting the database uh, table to have five users in it where five people might have signed up again in the background already and now you've got 10 and then it's the wrong value. So it becomes increasingly more difficult to write these tests with absolute inputs and output values that you're expecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, end-to-end -end tests are, are sometimes involving these bots that will act as users. They will, mm. if there's a thing to click on, they will click on it. So they will try to emulate a user doing something on your website, for example, um, to, to do it entire thing. So uh, yeah, it, mm. is, it is, it is. It, it is also part of the end-to-end -end testing. So good, good, good explanation mm. on that. Um, yeah. So once we're done with end-to-end -end testing, once we have the, all those things, so <coughs> you have your user acceptance testing. That's a that's a separate type of text, it, test. It's not a very technical test. It's a, hey, I have a subgroup of users who want to beta test my thing, and then you basically provide them access to this, and that's my UAT in this in this in this thing. So, mm. um, so that's kind of a kind of a, a, a one of one of the approaches of, of UAT, and and UAT mm. or user acceptance testing is. Anything like I've I've deployed networks and we had UATs on a part of a network just to make sure that Wi-Fi is good enough and that people are satisfied with it. And it's more of a it's it's not a very technical test because like you may get technical feedback from people, but it's more like uh, I like it or I don't like it as much. Uh, this feature is not the thing I wanted. So um, take it take your UATs with a pinch of salt always. But yeah, fun fun user testing at the moment. I just realized this is not the right cap for this specific soda stream bottle that I have at home. So it's like. Yes, it can fit and close the bottle. from somebody? Or... <laughs> no, 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 no. It says we've got two different sets of bottles, okay. I'm assuming. Um, I'll need to go check because I know some of the caps I've seen are black, some of them are gray, and I've just never paid attention. But yeah. There you go. <laughs> Fun little failure in production. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a question here from uh, M4 Anishan. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Could you give us some insight into AWS Canary? Uh, if now, uh, not now, in a separate video as well, I'm really interested in it. Don't know that it's been discussed in a previous video. Mm. What is AWS Canary? I just Googled it. Okay. I just Googled it and I was just curious because I thought it was a new service that I'd missed and no, yeah. it's not. No, it's um, not. Okay. So 
uh, it's called a canary deployment or okay. um, having that. a canary version out of your app. And it's it's more a concept and there's yeah. no specific way that you would implement it because there are various ways. It's that classic one with, it depends. Um, so what you would do is that a canary deployment as such is where you take your code and you deploy it. And then what you do is you send some traffic to it, not all traffic, to test whether or not it's working. And then that allows you to make sure, A, does it function the way it's supposed to? Does it have any impact on the system as a whole? Um, you might have also heard about dark launching features. Um, it's, a, it's a case where uh, as you progress in terms of like getting more mature with your software process, you can actually release code behind feature flags. That means yeah. the code has been deployed, but the code is not being um, used yet. So there's literally a flag that says, what, unless this flag is said, don't use this new code path that we just added. Um, yeah. And this actually happens quite often. And then what you can do is there are various ways you can say, let's start shifting some traffic over there. You can, for example, on your load balancer, say, send 5% of the traffic to this new version. And you can even add filters. So what you can say is send 5% of all traffic originating from, as an example, Germany to yeah. this new one, because this is a feature that we know might be applicable to German users. Um, or for people with specific characters in their names or specific length of names, or there's a whole bunch of features. Because remember, as you've got traffic coming in, you can see um, what the request is that you're dealing with and then figure out how um, you want to filter and do those things. And the reason is that it prevents this whole big bang of here's the version two, it's broken. Everybody, you're down. Yeah, so yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, mm. you know, I, I also thought like, oh, a service? Did we launch a service? I didn't know. And that happens, by the way, that happens. We get a service launch and, and you tell us about it. So <laughs> uh, don't, be, don't be concerned about that. But yeah, yeah that, those are canary deployments. And, and feature flags mm. are, are a very powerful thing because um, one great thing about feature flags is that you can have code deployed in production, but not be accessible. So, um, so feature flags are, are a thing that you can have a basically a fully running version of your new code or a feature or something, but it being disabled. Then, as Kobe yeah. said, enable it for a subset of the user or for everybody by just toggling it on and on and off. So, yeah. And if you wish to use AWS for that, um, AWS App Config is a great tool to mm. give you feature flags. So, App Config gives you the ability to actually just, hey, here's a here's a, a, a configuration you can request from an API, and it can be just a flag. So, um, mm. that that is that is a great way to to approach that. So, yeah. But yeah. Um, cool. So. To, to slowly wrap up, I just want to mention one last type of testing. And this is your the ultimate testing, the, the testing once your code is in production. That's actually a great connection to feature flags and to canary deployments. Because when you do things like canary deployments, you are automatically applying some testing strategies to a production workload. Why? Because you are mo continuously monitoring how your code acts in production. Mm. And if something goes bad, you can roll back. Hopefully, <laughs> if you have the right tooling and, and, and deployment procedures in place. So think of it as this. Cobus launches his application that does YouTube and it's, it's running on somewhere, whatever. And all the tests pass, unit tests, integration tests, metric tests, perfect, excellent. But there's just something about this. Cobus says there's only one production something about production that's different is it the user load is the amount of data is it the the lag between different elements of the cluster for some reason the code just doesn't work good it you you notice it oh there is a a, a, a latency in my calls there's all of a sudden a higher spike of utilization in my servers or I get bad requests back. I get a lot of five XX errors on my on my on my application logs. This is the ultimate testing. Or you know, hey, that's the better option. But if you get a tweet, that's the worst. So <laughs> you get you keep on monitoring for these errors. You keep on looking. You 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 know you're constantly looking for this information coming out of production. And if you reach a threshold, you're like, okay, this is bad. Roll it back. Um, and no harm done. Well. No harm done. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, we can probably dedicate the entire next episode on rollback is sometimes a myth. Okay. So next episode, rollback. Um, mm. We're going to talk about actually the deployment strategies. Actually, that's a good point. Next next episode on on Wednesday, next Wednesday, 
this discussion about software deployment strategies. So we talked about testing strategies. Mm. Next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about software deployment strategies. Um, yeah. So, but the rollbacks are important. And, and you know, in this mm. case, canary deployments are very useful because um, you can you don't have to release it all to see that you've made a mistake. But also, if you're mm. not even doing canary, if you're just doing your standard deployments, you can still keep on looking at things. Hey, does this work? Is this okay? Does this function? Is it fine? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also, um, at one of the places I used to work, we had a, a suite of testing and it ties into the question from uh, Prad Heeper about uh, load testing. Um, the reason I'm combining with load testing is we used uh, JMeter, uh, which is an Apache project that you can use to run tests against APIs. It yeah. can do load testing for you add, uh, as well with interesting ramping up um, I actually used it for our Let's Build episode that we did uh, earlier this year. Um, sorry, last year. I don't even know if it was this year or last year. My brain just froze. Um, but in any case, what it is, like, it, it, it's got the ability to also um, connect different steps to it. So the API that we were dealing with is we had a, a couple of test users in the system with actual data, but we knew that that data wasn't changing over time. So what it would do is, like, it would first do a call to authenticate the user, get the auth token back, and then do a whole bunch of subsequent calls saying, listen, get me this person's... X information, that information, and there were some aggregates um, as well where the data was processed by a model um, and then stored, and then afterwards in that in that changed shape, we could also do tests against that after every single time we deploy. We automated this. So this is a case of there was a bold step like once production deployment is completed um, and it's up, start running this JMeter to test for us and make sure that it's working. Um, the the other uh, load testing tool that I've seen and I would love to use this purely because of the name is, and I'm not joking here, is called Bees with Machine Guns. I was always want to mention that. Love it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Basically, that spins up EC2 instances and uses those to actually do them. Um, and another great use is using uh, Lambda functions um, to actually do that. Because what you can do is you can set your Lambda function off uh, to pull from a queue and actually use that to then start load testing from multiples. And what you can do is you can write something that very quickly fills up the queue with how many thousand or hundred thousand or million of requests that you want, and then you can parallelize your Lambda and actually have like a bunch of these just start hammering your server. Um, you just need to worry, obviously, about the concept called storming and herd or uh, uh, in terms of your APIs. Like herd. often APIs, when you herd um, a thousand requests immediately, that will that you know storms your API and hurt uh, and hurts it. It's like that thunking will hurt. Uh, so you want some kind of ramp up top. And I know JMeet is actually quite good with that configuring and saying, listen, yeah. ramp up to 50 users with 50,000 requests each over the first two minutes. So there's a linear ramp up or logarithmic or however you want to configure it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I think also also the, these types of testing are part of that integration or that bigger the second testing part where you have things deployed in a in a very similar systems production like systems. A low test on a, on a, on a, on an alpha or beta uh, system, you know, doesn't doesn't give you a lot of information back. It just tests your alpha and low uh, beta system. It might give you information if you're trying to get the metrics out to see how much of how much the code is optimized. Yeah, but usually you should do that something that looks like production. Mm. Of course, you you will not have a copy of production somewhere, um, unless you you can afford it. Um, but um, <laughs> as 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 close as it can be to production, this is something you should use load tests for. Or so yeah. never load test in production, um, unless you have no. a specific reason to do that. Because I, I I had folks try to do that. I've worked with folks who who are just like, hey, I will run JMeter or, or BlazeMeter uh, uh, against my production system just to see how much it handled. Don't. It's gonna cost you money. It's, you know, plan for mm. higher load, but test on mm. something else. And you can't even imagine what happens if your higher load test breaks your production. So, mm. <laughs> um, yeah. One more question here from uh, Pratt Hipa, which is around um, geo-specific load you can simulate with JMeter. The good news is you can. And now here's, here's a fun little hack for you to get this going in the, in the probably the fastest way possible. Go use code build. Um, code yeah, because code build effectively, um, you can provide your own container for it to run in, which means you can pre-configure JMeter inside the container and set everything up with how you want to test it. Then what you do is you use, because code build itself, you can set up a code build job with a container and say, go run that for me with yeah. very little setup. You do that with infrastructure as code, um, 
Terraform CDK cloud formation. And then what you do is you uh, you decide which regions you want to deploy that in the world. And all of a sudden you've got the geo distributed testing system. Um, people tend to think of code build as just a service to you know build my code with, but effectively it is a mechanism to run a Docker container with very little scaffolding effectively. So it's probably the fastest way just to get a container up and running um, and do that. So that's, that's what I've done in the past actually. Um, Code it didn't build most, anything. It most, literally just ran test. Code build is the most universal to testing tool out there. <laughs> it, yeah, it's very closely approaching lambdas to to the way you can do that. But yes, code build. Um, mm. Most of your unit tests on AWS you run code build, but in this case, you can have a JMeter thing to do that as well. So mm. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so we're reaching up close to the to the one hour mark, uh, and I have a really hard cutoff at at, at at one one p.m. I have to deliver some training, so. Um, uh, that has been discussion about about software testing strategies, right? On AWS mm -hmm. in the cloud, wherever we have not focused purely here on some specific tooling or not. We just talk generally about those things. Um, we like to continue talking about these these type of top, type of topics, and and uh, we enjoy them. We we have experience with them, and hey, it's DevOps, right? It's a box of DevOps. And <clears throat> next week, we're going to be discussing something similar, but this time it's going to be deployment strategies and also, most importantly, the rollback strategies. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, yeah, you need to have a good, 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 good deployment strategy is the one which has a rollback strategy. Um, so, yeah, uh, we're going to be talking about that next week at the same place at the same time. Actually, it's not the same time. It's next week. It's at 1 time is relative Central Darko. European time. So we are heading into the fun week of the year. Remember, daylight savings changes kick in this coming weekend for yeah. those that do have daylight savings. I don't. Darko does. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, this will bring some disruption with it as well. Um, so, for example, I know today we didn't update the official uh, AWS Twitch schedule. Apologies for that. That was my mistake. I forgot to send off the request to have that changed. Yeah. Um, but then from next week, we will be in the um, in the slot as indicated on the official AWS Twitch schedule. Um, before we do run, however, I'm not going to do this the sponsor joke again because I don't want to have people run away again. Um, <laughs> but this video or this stream will be on our channel for uh, called Not Docker, Not Quibus. You can see it. Uh, let me find Just it. Just underneath right here. there. Underneath the beard over here. Um, <laughs> you, can see, and you can also see our different uh, details there. Um, I see we lost the Twitter icon. I'll need to go fi fix this little image of ours. Um, but yeah, you can follow us on Twitter and also on our individual um, streams on Twitch. The reason we always promote this is that we want to make sure that people are aware of those and look at those because we won't always be streaming on the AWS Twitch channel yeah. officially. So if you do enjoy these things, go subscribe there and you can get notified when we go live when it isn't on AWS because sometimes there are events or there are other reasons where, why we can't stream here. But we still continue talking. Yeah. And, our sponsor and it's much more fun having was, people. Yeah, and as Pedro masks here, <coughs> so we don't forget to to add the the sponsor. Our sponsor today was coffee. Um, coffee made. Ah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we will post the link to um, to coffee. By the way, um, so yeah, I think that's it. We can go back. Kobus, before we go, I want to show you something, uh, and everybody else on stream. I, you know, you know, I'm a collector of useless technology or old technology or things that waste power <sighs> for no apparent reason. Um, yes. I got something. <laughs> it's a small oh, wow. TV screen. So it's a Sony PVM or a professional video monitor. Um, it's big. <laughs> it's heavy. Um, and it's only nine inches. So it's a, it's a relatively small little TV, but excellent for that Super Nintendo out there. So, uh, oh, yeah, wow. Um, I just need to find where to. Well, you can, you can use it for shoulder presses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's not the lightest of things in the world. And I was just joking with my wife a couple of days ago. I was like, imagine if there was a world where f mobile phones were not invented and the way you go in to bed and watch YouTube was like, you have to bring a small TV. Put it so, yeah. so here's a fun thing. Um, if you go read the old sci-fi novels by Isaac uh, Asimov. Asimov, yeah. Um, because they were written, I believe, in the 50s. So at that point, yeah. obviously, as a sci-fi writer, he was thinking about future ways of doing things. There was no concept of cell phones or mobile devices or yeah. anything. So the way he envisioned it was a method that a instance message comes to you as a piece of paper, I believe, where there's systems like uh, tube systems inside the spacecraft or house or something, and yeah. out pops this message, if I remember correctly. And it's fun reading those old, old sci-fis where these things were not even thought about or spoken about yet. So the idea of how to solve that problem is super interesting. 
Exactly. Or, or just or just play Fallout. Fallout is in a world where transistors have never been invented. So everything is vacuum tubes and triodes and all that stuff. <laughs> Triax. So uh, it is <laughs> it, 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 it is pretty fun. So mm. <laughs> Yeah, Fallout. I am still trying to finish Fallout 4. I actually I had logged 160 hours on it and I can that because there was a period um, where, where children were born where I didn't play at all. So I can't remember what I was doing, what my build was. So I've restarted. I've now managed to log about the same amount of time and I've done one main quest. I'm just doing side quests and pimping out my character. I'm already on level, I think I'm 51 now or oh, something. Wow. So That's good. yeah, That's good. no, it's, I love cool. the just wandering and doing random things. But yeah, we are entering the end of t today's session. Today. Darker needs to run. He's I getting nervous. Run. I can talk for another hour. No, cheers. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Uh, thank you all for joining. Hope you liked it. Let us know uh, on the social medias on everywhere you can see here. Reach out to us if you have any suggestions, ideas for upcoming topics. Next week, deployment strategies, real rollback strategies at the same place at the same time. We will be seeing you here once again. Thank you all and have a nice week. Bye-bye.